Hey everybody, this is uh, Dr. Joe on this uh, Wednesday. I uh, hope all is well. I've had a great week and having a good week myself. Um, you know, uh, getting a few things sorted out, get ready for the Christmas Day, which is going to be on Sunday. And, um, and you know, get ready to uh, eat, drink, and be merry, as they say. Uh, anyway, again, I hope all is well. Uh, today we're going to have a interesting title. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, real life lessons uh, you can learn from the board game Monopoly, and um, you know, so uh, it's it's an amazing game. I think everybody has played that game at some point, or if you if you haven't played, it, I'm sure you're aware of the program. Uh, you know, the, the the game. It's a very interesting game, and uh, so as I sort of uh, you know did more uh, research about the game, I realized. Uh, how interesting it is. And there's a lot that we can learn from that game. Uh, you know, real life lessons, you know, from a landlord in, from an investment standpoint, for, uh, you know, building wealth perspective. There's just so much to this program, uh, this board game, that uh, I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, dig a little deeper and share my thoughts about this program uh, on this uh, today's uh, live stream. So anyway, again, my name is Joe Asimo, Dr. Joe. I hope all is well. And uh, as normal, uh, towards the end, we're going to have the, um, the uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, uh, Q&A session. So if you've got some questions that you want to pose to me, uh, feel free to, uh, you know, place them in the chat room. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get to them towards the end of the, today's live stream. So real life lessons you can learn from the, the, the board game Monopoly. You know, I recall I was on vacation not too long ago and uh, with my family and uh, um, my wife's sister's family. And uh, so it's about nine of us on vacation together. And, uh, and so one evening, you know, we all kind of decided, OK, what should we do? And we decided to, to, to play this game. Monopoly. So we, you know, we got the boards out. You know how it is. You share the cards, and uh, and ultimately uh, you start the game. And uh, in this uh, session that we had, my niece, uh, you know, uh, who's uh, all my, you know, it's, yeah, my niece. Uh, she, you know, she's younger. I think she's uh, probably in the mid-teens now. And uh, she, she won. She won the game. And it was uh, her and I were the final, the last two. Uh, less standing, and we're the last two standing, and uh, you know, and and she won, and they're they're all I think everybody was ganging up against me anyway, and uh, but uh, but it was very interesting, and uh, and so what I want to do is kind of delve a bit more about this game, and uh, I learned so much, and I think we that's what we're going to share today. Yeah, for, for starters, um, you know, uh, Monopoly is really I think at the end of the day a game of strategy. Uh, it's not just sort of, uh, you know, just play and see what happens kind of thing. There's a lot of strategy involved, uh, how you can manage your money, uh, and how, you know, and there's lessons there we can sort of go towards, you know, securing our financial future. And trust me, you can learn a lot from that game. And uh, so anyway, so let's dust off our childhood memories of Monopoly and, uh, you know, and let's, let, let's, let's, let's dig a little deeper into this game so one what's the first thing that uh i think uh that i learned from the game is the importance of starting is really to save early you know save early because uh when play monopoly you know if you don't begin investing early if you don't start investing buying properties uh early you'll be forced out of the game uh sooner rather than later why because you know if you don't buy anything the bulk of your cash is going to be spent paying rent to other people. Okay, you're going to land on other people's uh, property, and you're going to have to pay rent. Okay, so if you don't start saving money early uh, and start investing early, all you're going to do, you're going to be coming paying rent uh, to other people. Okay, that's the first thing. Anyway, so so what does it mean in real life? Start investing as soon as possible. And you're going to say, "Well, Dr. Joe, but I've got student loans. I got." You know, cost of living is high and the wages are, aren't keeping up and da, 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 da. I, I don't have any money to save, you may say. Um, well, hey, if you don't save, you don't own assets, you know, you're going to be paying rent to other people. 
Okay, and uh, you know, so let's start it early, save a little money. I mean, we you you we all can save, we all can save a little more, set aside some funds. There's some sort of discretionary funds that you have that you can put aside and leverage the power of compounding interest. You know, save some, save some money, earn some money, and at some point, those little dollars and you know will come up to something significant. And hopefully, if you're smart enough you'll be able to buy some assets and those assets hopefully will appreciate in value and generate cash flow. So yes, so the important thing is um, you know, invest now. And uh, which kind of got me thinking as well. Uh, I recall when I first came to the United States, you know, I, uh, I think the second year after being here is when I bought my first house. And uh, I really didn't know what I was doing. You know the story. And uh, in the end, it was a disaster. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. But you know, looking back now, it's probably the best thing I ever did was to start early, buying investment properties early rather than wait until, you know, later on. So let the power of time work in your favor by starting early and acquiring assets. That's the first thing about, uh, real, you know, Monopoly is the importance of don't just play the game. You've got to start buying stuff, uh, buying assets, preferably buying assets that will increase in value. So the second thing I learned in, in um, I think that's important from uh, uh, the game of Monopoly is uh, always keep some cash on hand. Okay, uh, always have some cash on hand. Why? Because you don't know what's going to happen. You could land on somebody's property, and uh, the whole gay purpose of uh, you know Monopoly is to be the last person standing uh, or the last man, the last woman standing. Okay. And uh, so to win in this game, you got to have money left over, okay? So if you aimlessly move around the Monopoly board and, uh, you know, and just sort of buy anything, then uh, what will happen is that you're going to run out of money, okay? So it's important to start, but you can't just buy anything anywhere uh, because you're going to run out of cash. And uh, if you run out of cash in the game of Monopoly, what do you remember what, we, what you have to do? You guys have to. You have to start selling some of your property. You're going to start start selling some of your assets at a deep discount. Uh, in fact, you have to uh, mortgage them off. I think that's what they call it. Uh, the face value, and uh, because you don't have any money. Okay, so always have some cash at hand because once the you know we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, as I said before, and uh, unless you're lucky. You know, we don't always believe in luck, but unless you're lucky, something's going to happen and you're going to run out of money and you're going to become bankrupt. OK, the same thing is that, uh, uh, you know, happens in the real world. You know, if we went to enter a downturn like what we're going to right now, uh, I recall and I've been through four of these uh, market cycles. So I have a pretty good idea how this shakes out. But the idea is that as we go through a, 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 a downturn, if you don't have any money, and something happens, you're gonna have a rude awakening. You know, during the during the heyday, during the last few years, real estate was going up. Everyone was all happy. They're feeling like they're doing well, and they start spending, 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 spending. The problem is when the market turns and your tenants can't pay your rent because they lost their jobs or whatever it is. Then, if you don't have any money to set aside, hmm, you don't you know what's gonna happen there. Uh, you may have to end up selling your property. A steep discount in order to generate some cash. You may not be able to pay your mortgage. You may have to end up losing your assets. So uh, yes, so in, you know, so the second important thing on the game of to be successful in um, the game of Monopoly is always have some cash on hand. So same thing in life, you've got to have some money set aside for a rainy day. Okay. Um, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, uh, let's have a look. let's get a scenario. I think, uh, I recall many years, in fact, it was this week. Yes. Yeah, so how about that one? This week, one of my tenants called me, uh, on a, uh, I thought it was about three, uh, I don't know, three, I won't say three o'clock, about six o'clock in the morning. So uh, the phone rings six o'clock a.m. You know when someone calls you at six a.m. It's not usually good news. Uh, anyway, I got a call from this tenant saying, uh, "Hey, the hot water heater has busted, and it's flooding the basement." Okay, so how about that for a six a.m. call? 
And uh, but as you know, uh, for me, I have all my I have all my properties under the home warranty. So I said, no problem, no no big deal. Um, you know, let's uh, shut off the water at the at the main, and uh, you know, let's see what we can do. So I called the home warranty company as an emergency, and they're able to get a a plumbing company over there. And lo and behold, we needed to have a new hot water heater. And uh, I think the, the total cost was like, I don't know, 3000 something dollars. But I ended up paying $75 uh, out of that. So, you know, what does that tell us? If I didn't have that home warranty and this uh, hot water heater busted, uh, for un, you know, just because of wear and tear, I'd have to come up with 3000 bucks or whatever it is to get a new one. And uh, if I didn't have that cash available, if I didn't have the access to those funds available and, uh, and so on, then it would be very, very difficult. So again, it's important to have some cash set aside because we just don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And the same thing in uh, the game of Monopoly. To be, so, to be able to survive and win the game, at least be the one of the people standing, you got to have cash. Okay. So the other thing. I learned from the game of Monopoly is uh, to be patient. Okay. To win in the game of Monopoly, you got to be patient. You got to have a game plan. Okay. Uh, you know, you usually can't win by just buying anything you can get, anything you land on. You, you can't. At some point, as I said before, you're going to run out of money. So, therefore, uh, you have to therefore make a decision as to what do you buy. And uh, if you're impatient, okay. You start buying everything. As I said before, you're going to run out of money very, very quickly. And therefore, you know, you've got to know what to buy, when to buy it, and what to pass on. Okay. So similar kind of thing in the real estate investing. I get calls all the time from wholesalers. Hey, Dr. Joe, I got this hot deal. You know, da 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 da. You know, hey, this is great super deal at this location. Da 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 da. You know, I have very clear criteria as to what I'm looking for and what I'm looking to buy and what I'm not looking to buy, okay? So I just decided I'd rather be patient until, uh, you know, deals uh, or opportunities that meet my criteria come on board. Now, when they do come, I move fast because there's a pretty good chance that somebody else is going to pounce on it, um, you know, if I don't uh, move fast. So, I mean, like, for example, today, I get a you know a message from uh, a real estate agent about a potential opportunity at a property that meets my criteria, and so I'm very interested. And uh, so hopefully in the next day or two, I'll be able to go out to the property, have a look at it. If it makes if if it makes sense, we can agree on terms. I am definitely going to go for it uh, because I'm patient. I know exactly what I want, what I don't want, and uh, and the same thing I think in the game of Monopoly. You just have to be patient and because patience is an integral part of your success and uh, and so on. Successful investors don't just hope uh, based on their, you know, they don't sort of use hope as their only criteria. Uh, they invest in a disciplined approach. OK, so patience is a very integral part of that approach there. So same thing with monopoly. Patience is a virtue, as they say. What's number four? Plan for the unexpected. Okay, that's another thing about uh, uh, what, what you can learn from the game of Monopoly. The same thing in real estate investing as well, especially buy and hold, is uh, plan for the unexpected. Even though it's important to buy stuff as soon as possible in the game, uh, you still need to have that cash buffer, as I talked about before. And uh, just in case something comes up, that meets all your criteria. Uh, but as soon as you get the money from the bank, okay, uh, it's always good to just set aside some, uh, you know, some 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 money aside, uh, either under the board or in the back pocket, as they say, just in case. Okay, something unexpected happens, like you got to pay your taxes, uh, you got to pay your insurance bill. Hey, what do we do about taxes? Uh, I think you know that in DC or in in Maryland, uh, you know, since I own properties over there, towards the end of the year, that's when all the tax bills are due. And there's a lot of taxes, uh, at least I pay anyway, and taxes are quite expensive. And uh, so you got to have some money set aside for those things. You got to plan for those payments because if you don't pay, the government's going to take you home. 
uh, potentially. So what's the, what does this mean in terms of plan for the expected in real life? We all need to have some extra funds available uh, for emergencies like medical uh, expenses, car troubles, or whatever it is. One of the easiest ways to build your emergency fund is just to automate, okay, automate your savings. And uh, because that will allow you to set aside some money and uh, for these unexpected uh, situations that occur. So, uh, you know, there are several apps that can help you in that automation process. Uh, I think there's one called Chime, uh, which makes it easy for you to save money, uh, especially as you have, um, you know, as, as, as money's come in. So the idea is that uh, money's come in and these programs uh, take the money out uh, on a regular basis and set it aside in a different account such that, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, you don't go off and spend it. So plan for the unexpected is another thing about, uh, you know, real estate investing uh, from the game of Monopoly. So anyway, uh, don't forget, enter your questions. As usual, we're going to have a Q&A session towards the end of this program. And so have your questions available in the chat box. And I'll be more than happy to answer those questions uh, shortly. So uh, what's, the, what's the next thing? that we learned from the game of Monopoly, I think is focus on cash flow. Cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Uh, you know, because in the game of Monopoly, you start off with some money, you know, you get off with, uh, I think 300 bucks or what, uh, 500, I forgot what it is you start off with. You know, the banker gives you some money just to get going. And uh, the goal is to be the last person standing with money, okay? And the way to win in the Monopoly is by collecting rents, okay? And uh, how do you, what does that mean? It means that you get cash flow, okay? That's how you win in the game of Monopoly is uh, having cash flow, having, owning assets, people land on your assets and they pay you rent, okay? And that rent that you collect plus the money that you have set aside will allow you to buy more assets and more assets will then give you more cash flow or you can trade these, uh, you can buy more houses and uh, and ultimately, you can trade these houses for a hotel. Okay, so you can generate even more cash flow. Okay, so that's really what it is. If you own all four of the uh, properties in a group, and uh, you're in a pretty good position because uh, you know now you can get even more cash flow. And uh, I know that if you, like in the railroads, there are four railroads in the game of Monopoly. If you own all those, uh, apparently that's 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 one of the strategies. Uh, you get the most cash flow is by owning the four railroads, okay? So what does that mean? Over time, assets increase in value because of the cash flow that they generate. And you can acquire cash flow by acquiring more assets, okay? Every time someone, uh, something as simple as a savings bond, you know, you save money, yes. And, it, you know, you got a, a, an interest rate that's earned from that and uh, it generates cash flow. So, uh, the important thing is to make sure that your assets generate enough cash flow to sustain itself. And then ultimately, that cash flow will help you uh, to quit your job or have more time to do what it is that you want to do. Uh, I learned that lesson very, very early when I had a conversation with my ex-boss at that time. If you recall, uh, at the time when I started, uh, this guy had like 10 houses and uh, he lost his job. He got fired. And uh, he wasn't really that particularly worried because he had these rental properties and this rental pro these rental properties were generating cash flow for him. And that's the words of wisdom he gave to me. He says, Joe, this could happen to you. OK, if you're not careful, look into real estate investing. But whatever you do, try to keep your houses. Don't just sell them. And uh, and that's what because he said that, you know, you know, the asset will generate cash flow. And uh, it's very tempting to sell the asset, uh, to sell the golden goose, but keep them, Joe. And uh, I really didn't understand that, uh, that, that concept when I first started. But I really understand it now because houses that, uh, you know, uh, that started off, at least for me, I look at my portfolio, I was earning $50, $60, $100 in cash flow at the time are now gener generating two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 in cash flow today. It takes time, um, but as rents increase, as the value increases of the property, you can then leverage that equity 
to acquire more assets, which will then generate more cash flow. Okay, so uh, focus on cash flow, and uh, you'll be okay. And that's the important thing from the game of monopolies. That's number six: generate passive income. It's kind of similar to the last one. Uh, in monopoly, you know, nothing is sweeter than owning a hotel. Okay, why? Because hotel ownership is a winning strategy because it means that you can charge the highest rent when somebody lands on your property, okay? And what's the real life lesson from this? Start earning passive income while you sleep. That's the goal. Earn passive income while you sleep. I have rental properties every month. The money's coming in, you know, through the Section 8 program, of course. Uh, I don't have to worry about it. You know, whether it's good times, bad times, it doesn't matter. That money is hitting my account every first of the month, okay? It's passive income. Now, real estate, I'm not just gonna say it's totally passive in the sense that you don't have to do anything. Things happen. Uh, I gave you the story about the hot water heater uh, that happened to me earlier this week. And so every so often you're gonna have to do something, okay? But it's not the same as active income like I had to do when I was working originally. Uh, passive income is, is is very good because in the fact that it hits your account, whether come what may, and if you have the right systems in place and so on. So, you know, maybe you can even rent uh, a room in your house uh, if you have one or an apartment and get uh, some cash flow there, or you can house hack. Uh, you may have some skills that uh, and talents that you can possibly leverage in order to generate passive income as well. So again, there's lots of ways that we can generate passive income. And I think it's important that we look at that because that way the money comes to you, whether you um, uh, are working or not, whether you're doing anything or not, and uh, and so on. So that's the other thing about the, you know, the game of Monopoly. It's you've got the asset, people land on it, and they pay you. You don't really have to do anything. You've done the hard work by paying for the asset originally, but once it's paid, it's yours and you generate income. Seven, the most expensive asset is not always the best asset, okay? Uh, huh, that's a good lesson uh, for Monopoly because most people in Monopoly uh, want to own, you know, the most expensive assets like the park place and the boardwalk, okay? Uh, since they're the biggest payouts. And, uh, but they're not really, although they're the most expensive, um, you know, houses to or assets to own in the game of Monopoly. You know, many people lose at Monopoly by owning the most expensive pieces because they just don't pay attention to not just, uh, uh, you know, cost, but also, you know, cash flow as well. So there's a, you know, you got to sort of look at the cost of the asset and not just the cash flow generated from the asset by itself. Uh, so focus on cash flow without taking into account the cost paid to attain those cash flows is also like playing the game with blinders on. You know, those two kind of come together. Uh, so what does that mean? Like, for instance, I know in the Washington, D.C. extra area is very expensive and uh, a lot of people can't start here. You know, and that's OK. You start where you can. Uh, and then over time, you can sort of start acquiring better uh, properties in better areas, and hopefully, uh, you know, you'll sort of uh, gain more from appreciation over time. So, the most expensive assets is not always the best place to start, it's not always the best place to own. Um, you know, and so uh, just bear that in mind as well. Sometimes there are some deals from bargains, and the owning boardwalk and park place is not only the, it's not just the only way to win in the game of Monopoly, you win by making the most money. And uh, investing, uh, buying low and selling high is how you make the money through real estate investing and so forth. So the most expensive asset is not always the uh, the best asset. I mean, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that you start where you can and you don't always need to start off in A neighborhoods uh, or B neighborhoods. If you don't have the money, you start where you can. If you all you got the money is in C and D area, then start there. Okay, you don't have to wait and wait and wait until you got all the money together before you can jump in at the A neighborhood level. Uh, we all can't start at the park place and the boardwalk. We have to start somewhere else sometimes just because of uh, where we are financially. And number eight is uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, you know, in, uh, in the game of Monopoly, 
you won't win much in Monopoly if just by owning one property on the board. Okay, you won't. Um, you know, because uh, the chances are that people aren't going to land on it. Okay. And so if you put all your assets in the one basket, you buy all your houses, all your hotels on just one asset and cross your fingers and hopefully people will land on it. You may be lucky and people, uh, you know, occasionally will land on it. But the best way is to spread your assets over the board or in different areas of the board. OK, so spread your properties uh, throughout the board. That's the better strategy. And therefore, there's multiple chances of capturing rent. The same principle applies to investing. If you bet everything on one or two stocks or properties, um, that's okay because every so often maybe you may strike gold there, but the chances are, you know, you won't. So spread all your money uh, by acquiring multiple properties. Um, but then again, you don't want to sort of buy a hundred different houses in hundred different locations and hundred different types and uh you know all different criteria it, there's there's value in concentrating uh your efforts and uh and so on in, in the in the form of diversification so i suppose the opposite of this don't put all your eggs in one basket is don't become too diverse because you spread yourself too thinly and uh, so you kind of have to get the right mix that makes the most sense for you uh and so on so these are the eight principles that i've got from, um, you know, from the game of Monopoly. What's the bottom line here? The bottom line is that, of course, you know, uh, you know at the simple level, um, you know, Monopoly is, uh, it's just, it's a game. But I think if you drill down, there's a lot of principles uh, associated with that game that, uh, you know, that we, you and I can learn, okay? Things like uh, spreading yourself across the board. Okay, by uh, you know spreading your wealth over multiple properties, it's good to own multiple properties and not just hope on just one. Uh, but do it intelligently if you're going to buy multiple properties. Keep cash on hand. Focus on cash flow. Be patient and pay attention to the price that you're paying. Uh, these are some of the lessons um, and guideposts uh, that I think if you uh, use those concepts in Monopoly, I like can do in your invest in uh, you know uh, a journey you'll do yourself good so let me just quickly uh go through those eight principles again and then we'll go to q a so if you've got your questions get your questions together i'm going to go to them very very shortly and hopefully you know i'm going to see if we can end today a little earlier uh because i again i have some guests upstairs uh waiting for me to uh to come uh, so we can continue our Christmas celebration. So start saving early. Don't always wait. Okay. Uh, there's never a right time to start. The best time to start is now. A lot of people regret not starting a few years ago. Um, you know, so a lot of investors, I think one a wise person once told me, um, you know, the biggest regrets a lot of people are three. One, they wish they started earlier. Two, they wish they acquired more properties. Three, they wish that they kept more properties uh, and so on. Always keep cash on hand. You know, uh, have some reserves for a rainy day because things happen. And, uh, you know, hot water heaters break. Uh, houses get flooded. We're in a, a very cold spell. I sent a text to all my tenants today. Uh, let them know that certain things that they can do to reduce the chances of um, burst pipes and uh and so on so communicate uh because i know that if i don't have cash on hand something's going to happen and uh you know it's going to be difficult so be patient uh rome wasn't built in a day you can't reach financial independence on day one it takes time it takes it takes time and through the buy and hold investment strategy the good thing about that is that it allows you to um you know uh over time you you you, you use the power of time uh, you know, in your favor. So assets that may be, you know, expensive today, five, 10 years from now, it's going to be even more expensive. And uh, you let the power of time work in your favor. You can then tap into that equity that you have to acquire more properties. And therefore you can go down with a snowball strategy. Uh, plan for the unexpected. As I said before, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The emergencies occur. 
and uh, have your plan B, plan C, and plan D all ready just in case. Uh, then what else did I say? Number five is uh, focus on cash flow. Um, you know, I think uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. Cash flow is important because it allows you to pay your bills and also generate some excess money as well. Uh, number six is uh, generate passive income uh, whereby the money is coming to you come what may. I like the cash flow, uh, the passive income generated through uh, Section 8 because that money is guaranteed. It hits my account every month, come what may, regardless. Uh, the most expensive asset is not always the best. You start where you can. Um, you know, you don't always have to start off in A neighborhoods. Uh, if you have the income and the resources for a C or a D neighborhood, then start there. You got to start somewhere, maybe over time, you can go from a D neighborhood to a C neighborhood to a B neighborhood and so forth. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, you want to, you know, uh, acquire quite a few properties and, um, you know, and so on. Uh, the bottom line, as I said before, is that the game of Monopoly, don't spread yourself uh, too thin across the board, intelligently acquire properties, keep cash on hand, focus on cash flow, be patient and pay attention to price. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, I'm going to try and wrap this up session today. So I'm going to take a couple of questions and then we'll call it a day and uh, and so on. So let's have a look. What questions do we have? Uh, Johnny, great tips. Hey, Johnny, hope you're doing fine. Uh, you got to tell us about your, uh, you know, your property. Uh, I hope that, uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, your tenant is all ready to move in and hopefully they'll be in your property very very shortly and uh one of my tenants moved in there let's have a look when she moved in but friday last week and uh, that went well and uh she had what we call an emergency mood move and uh she was able to get into the property mid-month and i start getting my cash flow immediately so uh she's all happy got some nice photographs of her moving in and she's really really excited by the opportunity to live in a nice house in a nice neighborhood and spending christmas um you know with her as well so let's have a look next one is cars and crypto huh cars and crypto happy holidays dr joe cars and crypto huh who is this uh crypto 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 we heard a lot about crypto and um uh, huh, i don't know luckily i'm not in really into crypto i don't really understand crypto so i don't really in spend my money there uh, but maybe you can share with us uh your strategy for crypto um i'm looking forward to traveling next year uh put my uh what's it called uh travel plans in place it looks like in um uh, let's have a look uh let's see if i can get this off yeah it looks like uh what's it called uh the travel plans are kind of building right now i'm gonna be going to ghana i think in february and uh, look forward to that one um spending time with my mother my sister's gonna be in Ghana, so uh, I have two sisters and a brother, and we're all gonna be there um, at the end of my, you know, middle of late February. So I look forward to going to Ghana and uh, spending time with my other siblings. First time we've been together for a little while, and spending time with my mother as well. So I look forward to that one. So I'll probably spend my birthday in Ghana. Okay, let's have a look. Darren, uh, is the DCHA the best website to get the voucher rents. Uh, yes. Uh, if you're in Washington, D.C., then uh, the best website in order to, if you want to know what the rents are in uh, for your properties, uh, then the DCHA website is probably the best place to go. It's, it's organized a couple of ways. It's, it's organized by neighborhoods. So uh, based on where your property is, it's in a, a neighborhood, uh, a legal neighborhood, uh, which you need to find out. So sometimes um, properties are listed at, let's just say, I don't know, Capitol Hill, when legally it's not Capitol, it's something else. Or somebody may say my house is in Columbia Heights uh, when it technically it's not, and so on. So you need to find out the, the, the legal location of your property. Once you've got that, then you can go to the, um, the DCHA website based on the number of bedrooms that you have. The, then uh, and whether you are paying utilities or whether the tenant's going to pay utilities, they'll advertise what the rent's going to be. So that, but that's the best site to go to, dchousing.org slash 
uh, forward slash rent. And, um, you know, but we had a little experience uh, uh, with one of my students, uh, you know, last a few weeks ago, whereby they were asked him to reduce the amount that he was going to be paid. It's kind of weird. Uh, so we had a little battle uh, with DCHA folks. And ultimately, you know, we got a fair compromise. Uh, they were asking him to take a, a huge hit, 600 bucks a month rent reduction. But uh, we got that with pushback and ultimately uh, got that reduced like 60 bucks. Um, but yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, anyway, that's the website. It's the best place to go. If you want to know how much rent uh, that you can get for your property in your neighborhood where your property is located. Uh, in Maryland and in Virginia and other states, sometimes, uh, you know, what they say on their website is not always what you'll get. Um, you know, there's... I call it shenanigans and sometimes play. Um, so you have to be a bit more, uh, you know, uh, understand exactly how they determine their rent. Sometimes it's based on the inspector. Uh, sometimes you have to provide comps and, uh, and sometimes quite a bit of back and forth uh, in order to get the money that you want. So it uh, depends on the, your, 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 the jurisdiction where your property is located that will determine uh, what your rent is going to be. Okay, good question, Darren. Uh, anyway, I look forward to speaking to you, I think, on Friday, Darren. Uh, I'll send you a, a Zoom chat link uh, probably tonight or tomorrow. Okay, Marlon. Hey, Marlon. Hope, hope you're well. Uh, Dr. Joe, what strategy can I use during this downturn to continue investing? Oh, boy. Uh, what strategy? The strategy you should use, sir, is to get yourself ready to start buying. If, you are, if you're not already ready to buy, get ready. There's some, uh, why do I say that? Uh, it's because uh, the best time to buy real estate, based on my experience, is when the market's slow. Uh, best time to buy stuff is when stuff's on sale. Um, and uh, and that's what I'm doing. Um, you know, in fact, I'm starting a new program I think I shared with you uh, for those people who are looking to execute, not primarily uh, investors, but these are just regular folks. Um, but that's the time to acquire is uh, when the market's slow uh, because there's less competition. Sellers are a lot more reasonable. And uh, especially if you don't sort of focus on, uh, as long as you're not competing with homeowners, because homeowners will always pay more than you uh, or, or we as investors. So as long as you're not competing with those guys, uh, then really the best time to buy is, is, is during the downturn. Now that's part one. Part two is, just buying it for the sake of buying is not enough. You got to be able to hold on to that asset uh, until the market comes back. And we don't know exactly how long that's going to be. It could be months, it could be weeks, it could be years. So you got to have systems in place to be able to hold on to that asset. And that's the reason why I'm such a proponent of the Section 8, is because during the downturns, bad times, uh, if you get a good tenant, there's a pretty good chance the tenant's going to stay at your property. And there's a lot of demand, especially in uh, a lot of cities. For quality housing, quality locations, and uh, and so on. So if you can find a good tenant who loves your home, there's a pretty good chance they're going to stay a long time, and therefore you can ride out that storm uh, until the market comes back a few years from now, and then hopefully you can sell your house or asset if you want to do so. So um, what would I do? Uh, is really get your finances together, get your relationships with uh, real estate agents and uh, wholesalers, deal finders. And, um, you know, and start looking to acquire some uh, uh, at least another property and uh, such that, uh, you know, you can get a good deal. Hopefully you can negotiate hard, get a good deal at a fair price. And uh, at least compared to a few months ago when the market was kind of crazy. Now is the time things are slow. I uh, was speaking to a realtor uh, the other day and from what they're saying is that the market is dead. There's just very, very few houses being moved. So if you are able to buy, uh, you know, you can negotiate a lot harder because you have a lot more supply available to you. Good question, uh, Marlon. Yeah, we need to connect, man. Let me go for lunch or dinner, uh, as you promised, <laughs> and so on. Okay, Johnny H., do you have your thoughts? Again, put your, um, put your questions together. I'm going to see if we can wrap it up a little early today. But if you've got some questions, put it in the chat, and I'll try and get to them uh, before the end of the session. Dr. Joe, uh, uh, your thoughts on waterproof in basement? Is it worth the hefty price? 
Well, I mean, uh, what's the alternative to have a flooded basement? Uh, sometimes you have to do what you have to do. Now, if to waterproof the house, there's different ways to waterproof. Uh, some strategies are waterproofing is a little bit cheaper than others. So maybe that's a good way. Uh, I would, if you, before you waterproof your house, the first thing I would do is to find out where the water is coming in from. Okay. Uh, it could be something as simple as a gutter, uh, is not connected properly or the downspout is not being pushed away from the house far enough. Okay. So that's a very, th those are very cheap or inexpensive ways to fix the problem. Okay, it's to find out. So the first thing you have to do is to find out the, the root or the source of the problem and uh, and so on. Uh, so check your down, downspouts, check your um, the gutters and see if water is coming down uh, along the house and then find its way into the basement. That's the, something simple you can do. Uh, you can other things that I've done in the past. Let's so have a little memory by we you can dig a trench uh, if your house is back graded, i.e. that it slopes towards the house. Uh, then every time it rains, then water kind of eventually kind of pushes closer to your home. Uh, so you can put like a little trench on the outside and uh, dig a trench or, yeah, dig, dig a trench or dig a path, put some drain pipes, um, drain tile, they call it, uh, those black pipes. And, uh, and therefore, the water flows into that uh, trench and then gets redirected away from your house before it hits the basement. That's another inexpensive strategy you can do. Uh, what else? Depends where the water is coming from. The you know the most expensive thing, obviously, is to do what they call uh, uh, what do you call that thing? Uh, French drains inside your house, where you essentially dig around the perimeter uh, inside your home, and then you direct the water uh, through these pipes into a sump pump or to a pit, and uh, where you have a sump pump in there, and which pushes the way out pushes the water out. That's a bit more expensive. Um, so I don't know what your situation is, Johnny. Uh, but that part, if it's if it requires you to completely dig the perimeter of your basement and, uh, you know, that's just grunt work. Uh, you know, I've had we've done that several times. Um, it's labor intensive. You got to dig around the perimeter. You got dirt that you have to take away from the house um you know and the chances are you can't put a backhoe in there so you just have to break the ground and dig and then carry the dirt you know in buckets uh outside the house uh it's just back breaking work um but if that's what you have to do you have to it is what it is but there may be other ways uh whereby you can sort of uh identify where the source of the water is and hopefully uh you can fix it uh very inexpensively I know one of the, one of the houses I had uh, before we were about to dig, and we realized that uh, you know the downspout, uh, you know, just wasn't being pushed uh, further away from the house. And once we did that, that was it. You know, all we had to do was just buy some black black pipe, you know, for fifty bucks, and we you know we were done. So uh, hopefully that helps, uh, Johnny, and uh, and so on. So I'm going to wrap it up a second. If you don't have any more questions. Uh, it's now 7.50, uh, 7.45, sorry. And uh, I'm going to go upstairs and uh, enjoy some time with friends and family. Uh, you know, maybe play Game of Monopoly. How about that? Uh, anyway, did everyone watch the World, World, Cup, World Cup on Sunday? That was a fantastic game. Oh, my goodness. So exciting. And, uh, you know, very exciting game. But uh, kudos to uh, Argentina. They did well. But also kudos to France. They also did very well. So anyway, with that said, done, young, young, young folks. I uh, will see you uh, in the first part of next year. And uh, but uh, I've got my travel plans lined up. So it looks like we're going to Ghana in February, and uh, going to I think we're going to uh, Cancun because one of my real estate buddies is getting married in June. Uh, we're supposed to be going to uh, Uganda uh sometime in the fall and uh so i've got at least three countries so that will be three so maybe i'll do a fourth one somewhere and uh and so on oh my goodness got some questions at the end one of the best games yes it is it's a great game and uh thanks for your great input no problem johnny and uh merry christmas to you marlon and merry christmas to everybody 
and have yourself a wonderful holiday period. And I will see you in 2023. Take care, guys. Have a good night. Take care. Bye for now.